No five votes from TCS in the first quarter. Profits and margins beat expectations, but revenue misses estimates for the fourth straight quarter. Attrition also sees a sharp spike. India will be the fastest growing major economy this year, says the IMF. Pegs growth at 7.5%, well above China's 6.8%, but slashes global growth forecast marginally. We told you first, and it's now official, JSW Energy enters into a non-binding agreement to buy Monet Power. Sources say JSW hopes to pick up over 87% stake for 3,500 crore rupees. Shares in Shanghai recover after China bans major shareholders from selling for six months. Shares in Hong Kong, Tokyo and Seoul also perk up, but the Lal Street plays it safe ahead of earnings season. Greece needs a debt haircut, says the IMF. Germany agrees but says it's not possible under the European rules. The clock is tipping for Cyprus to present concrete plan. Markets rally on hopes of a deal. India and the United States signed the historic tax compliance agreement. Both nations can now exchange information on financial transactions made by their citizens to help arrest tax evasion. The BRICS Bank is open for business. Prime Minister Modi calls for a trade fair at the 7th Congregation of the Five Nations. Bloc will meet his Pakistan counterpart Nawaz Sharif in Russia tomorrow. Telecom companies may soon have to dial TRAI to raise their tariff plans. Sources say a government panel is in favor of the move. The panel does not approve of telecom companies signing deals with content providers. Major setback for the Madhya Pradesh government. The Supreme Court shifts all Vyapam cases to the CBI. The state's governor could get marching orders after a wrap from the court today. Fresh Havala twist to the 2G scam. Sources say the Enforcement Directorate has found evidence of Chennai-based JG Group helping main accused A. Raja siphon funds abroad for arrests made so far in a case where 10,000 crore rupees have been siphoned off. years ago the BSC was under a ban in free and today of course it's uh, you know one of the leading free market institutions of this country. <laughs> Learn from these great investors that you know the, there's a saying that you know in Wall Street at least that if you want a friend on Wall Street go get a dog but in Galal Street, there's a very equal system. They encourage young value investors like myself to learn. They share information very freely. See, BSE is running its own uh, race. It's not in race with anyone. And for me, BSE has to worry about uh, being relevant as a stock exchange in terms of the nation's needs. Well, imagine the world 140 years ago. No computers, no mobile phones, no cars. But if you wanted to buy shares, the Bombay Stock Exchange was just around the corner on the large street. 140 years on, it is the world's 10th largest exchange with a market cap of $1.7 trillion. India Business Hour and CNBC TV 18 wishes Asia's oldest stock exchange, the Bombay Stock Exchange, a very happy birthday. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. Hi, Surbhi. Hi, Shreed. I can't even imagine how trade was conducted all those years ago without those computers, without program trading and the algorithms. It's quite remarkable. Anyway, it's a very news-heavy day. We've got earnings, we've got deal activity and, as usual, the developing situation in Greece. All right, so let's kick things off with the day's trading action. Move over Greece. The earnings season is here. And both today played safe on the last street as India in gears up to report its first quarter results. Remember, expectations are not very high from this quarter. The Sensex lost about 100 points. And that too after a decent start. The index now well below the 28,000 mark. The Nifty lost about 30 points and it continues to move towards 8,300. No respite today for the mid-caps either as the mid-cap index lost nearly 50 points. And speaking of earnings... TCS has kicked things off this evening. It's been a steady first quarter, but one not without its glitches. Profits and margins ahead of street expectations, and that's thanks to higher utilization rates. But there were really no fireworks as revenue growth continues to stay muted for TCS. And this is the big worry, and this is what analysts were pointing out as well. Attrition has seen a sharp spike. In fact, 
the revenue has missed expectations and that has missed expectations for the fourth straight quarter. So the management believes that while it's been a steady start to the fiscal year, they continue to be optimistic about the road ahead. Listen into the management commentary and then we'll come back with an analysis. The sector in which we have got impacted is manufacturing, primarily because of the impact of Japan and the Latin America, the emerging markets, mm -hmm. which went down the 20 million, that did have impact on manufacturing sector, and we went down in media. Okay, so apart from that, this is the, this is the, the actual 20 million dollar miss, I gave you the math. So, uh, so we are very positive, or we are investing hugely in digital training. Mm -hmm. um, Deal wins are pretty strong, customer migration is pretty strong, uh, so we remain very positive for the rest of the year. Europe this quarter has grown on a year-on-year on -year basis 19%. Um, I think it's fair to say that my view is that neither Greece nor China is going to cause any immediate issues for us. We want, we, uh, usually the seasonality that comes in, which is people leave as a, because of higher studies, and people leave at the end of the year when we do our performance appraisal and all that. So there are some people who do decide to look for our, uh, options outside. What we are trying to do is we are trying to bring down the attrition definitely from where it is going forward to bring it down. And there are a number of steps that we are taking, digital training for 100,000 100, people across the organization. So if I go around and when, I, when we talk to people, the general feeling is pretty good. So there is not a major concern from that point of view, but from the overall number point of view, definitely. It, it's, it's higher. All right, that's the commentary coming in from the TCS management. Kritika and Rima, in-house experts, join us now to do the number crunching. Kritika, let me start by asking you, break down the numbers for us and what are the markets going to be watching out for tomorrow? Well, let me start with a number that might have the street uh, concern tomorrow, and that's the dollar revenue growth. Uh, the, there's been a growth of around 3.5 percent. The dollar revenue is coming in, uh, coming in at 4,036 million dollars. Now, that is lesser than what we were expecting. We were expecting anywhere between 4.5 to 4.8 percent. So, while that is a concern, some of the other numbers stand out. Uh, so, to quickly take you through them, uh, the rupee revenue growth has come in at about 6 percent, pat at 5,708.9 crore rupees. Margins have interestingly come in at 20. 6.3%. Uh, this has largely been aided with benefits coming in from currencies. This time, the currency has actually been a positive, and there has been operational efficiency, which has helped TCS contain their margins at the 26.3% figure. But the one figure that stands out is the volume growth of 4.8%. Now, I did quiz the management on exactly why there was a mismatch in the dollar revenue figure and in the volume figure. What they say is, in terms of volumes and in terms of the growth that they are seeing across verticals, uh, they we have seen a significant traction in verticals like retail, life sciences, uh, BFS, in most of the markets as well. But the only area where they're seeing uh, some kind of pressure is Japan, Diligenta, and North America, uh, and Latin America, and that has affected numbers as a whole. So there's been a contraction of around 20 to 25 million dollars, and that's really what's reflecting in the net sales figure. However, since the company is seeing a robust growth in terms of deal pipeline and in terms of the individual verticals, even if you look at the numbers, BFS up by 6%, retail up by 5.1%, life sciences up by 7%, management has tried to reiterate the fact that volume revenue, volume growth is a clear reflection of the fact that the overall business seems to be on track. More importantly, the company has said that uh, digital has been growing substantially. Today, they, they released a number. Digital is, as of today, about 12.5% of the overall revenue, and that is something that the company is uh, holding on to to be able to drive growth further. All right, Kritika, hang in there. Let me go across to Rima now. Rima, coming to you, growth seems to have moderated for TCS, at least as uh, Kritika was pointing out, as far as dollar revenue goes. How will the markets read this? Uh, will they see it as a mixed bag? Yes, it seems like a bit of a muted start uh, for TCS because dollar revenue is a mystery expectation for the fourth straight quarter now. Dollar revenue growth is 3.5%, lower than the 4.2% that we were anticipating. Volume growth looks good at 4.8%. Uh, constant currency growth is 3.5%, but it's not as exciting as the numbers, growth numbers we used to see in Q1 of previous years. So in that sense, growth is moderated. Margins are better than what the street was anticipating, which is why my sense of stock will fall tomorrow, but not too much because the margin and the profit figure 
figures is better than the street expectation. And the, imp uh, the reason why margins could have beaten expectation is there has been another quarter where utilization has gone up, staying about 85% mark for five straight quarters. The miss on the top line is because of the $20 uh, million dollar miss in Japan and Latin America, as the management pointed out. Diligenta continues to be soft. Energy will be soft going forward, though it reported a good quarter this time, good uh, revenue growth this time, while telecom will remain volatile. Attrition seems to be a big concern. It's gone up to 15.9% up for five straight quarters now. Overall, um, it's a muted set of earnings. Focus on the top line there. There has been a miss, so which is why my sense the stock will um, be under pressure tomorrow, slightly at least. All right, Rima, thanks so much for that. And just a quick reminder, don't forget to tune in to, to CNBC TV 18 tomorrow morning and catch the entire TCS stock management joining us, talking to us live on those numbers and the outlook ahead for this year, starting at 8.10 a.m. All right, from TCS to Wipro, the company's digital arm has announced its first acquisition. Wipro will buy Design IT for $93 million. The Denmark-based company specializes in product service experience for healthcare, telecom, banking, automotive, and the retail sectors. Wipro believes that this move will help it ramp up its digital business uh, services business, the company said in a statement, and I quote, This investment marks a further stage in Wipro's move to evolve the digital offer it, um, takes, uh, it takes to market, end quote. Well, we told you first, and it's now official, Monat Ispath has entered into a non-binding MOU with JSW Energy. The deal will be to sell Monat Power in a bid to pair its debt. Speaking exclusively to CNBC TV 18, Sanjay Sagar, the CEO of JSW Energy, stayed mum on the valuation, but he did admit that due diligence would be completed in the next two months. We have entered into a non-binding MOU for initiating a due diligence into the project. And uh, the decision whether to acquire a stake or not to acquire a stake will depend entirely on the outcome of the due diligence. We have not spoken to Monet about any valuation. I said the valuation, as I told you, will be uh, sort of arrived at once we've completed the due diligence and looked at the various aspects of the project. The controlling stake technically is above 51%, but we would probably be going in for a higher stake. Well, that's JSW Energy looking at Monet Power. Prina Barwa joins us now with more details. Prina, let's talk valuations. Uh, how much will a controlling stake cost JSW Energy? Well, we learned from sources previous to the deal that JSW Energy may pick up close to 87% stake in Monet Power. The valuation, as we understand, could be pegged at over 4,000 crore rupees. However, this is just a non-binding MOU that has been signed and JSW Energy will complete its due diligence process in the next 45 to 60 days. Now, talking about the power plant, it is a 1,050 megawatt thermal power plant located in Angol in Orissa. It has long-term PPA signed with the West Bengal Electricity Board as well. So clearly seems to be a good bet for JSW Energy as the company is on a lookout to acquire about 4,000 megawatt power plants over the next one year. And as Sanjay Sagar mentioned, they will acquire about two to three power plants in a bit uh, to ramp up its uh, power business. So once the due diligence process is complete in the next two months, and if the deal is sealed with Monet is part, uh, this could give Monet a significant relief as far as debt reduction is concerned. Back to you. All right, Brina, appreciate you joining us. So watch out for both those stocks in trade tomorrow. But hold your horses. Global growth in 2015 may not be as sound as one had earlier expected. That's the word coming in from the International Monetary Fund. But India will be the fastest growing major economy in the world, according to the fund, which also expects China to slow down further. Ritu Singh brings you the highlights of the IMF report. We are determined not to um, have a clash with Europe. I'm angry because we are in fact sleepwalking towards a Brexit. You should lead the Greek people out of the Eurozone with your head held high. Eurozone's problems with Greece may have no quick fix, but they're not a big risk to global growth. Nor is the idea that the equity bubble in China may be bursting. The real dampener for global growth comes from North America or more specifically, the slowdown seen there over the first quarter of 2015. Uh, the revision to the forecast comes in large part from the uh, terrible first quarter in the U.S. But, you know, the more we look at that quarter, it was an accident. It doesn't mean the U.S. recovery is weak. So I think on that, we're very much where we expected it to be. 
The IMF's World Economic Outlook report says this is the main reason it has revised its global growth projection for 2015 to 3.3%, lower than its earlier prediction of 3.5%. This means 2015 growth will also be lower than last year's 3.4%. However, it could pick up to 3.8% by the end of 2016 as activity rebounds in a number of distressed countries. Of course, this headline figure does not indicate the disparity in growth rates between the advanced and the developing economies. The IMF report says advanced economies may see growth at 2.1% in 2015 against 1.8% last year. So by the end of 2016, growth may come in at 2.4%. But on the other hand, economic activity in emerging and developing economies is expected to slow down in 2015 to 4.2% and then climbed to 4.7% by the end of 2016. India, meanwhile, seems set to remain largely insulated from most of these risks. So while China sees growth slow down from 7.4% in 2015 to 6.8% this year and to 6.3% over the next year, India is expected to grow at 7.5% in this year, faster than the 7.3% growth seen in 2014. However, this growth is expected to remain flat in 2016. There's always been a, a disconnect uh, between the Chinese stock market and the Chinese economy. And the Chinese stock market is not quite a casino, but it's not very far from it. It goes up, it goes down. Stock market capitalization in China relative to GDP is much lower than, say, in the U.S. Uh, it had gone up so fast that people probably didn't have the time to spend the capital gains. Uh, so it, it, it may have an effect on spending, but it's, it's more or less orthogonal uh, to what's really happening in China. Now the report argues that while the Greek crisis and the turmoil in China will dampen growth in the short term, they will not have any long-term or permanent impact provided countries are prepared to contain the fallout. This, the report says, they can do through timely policy action should the Greek situation indeed turn into a contagion. Other measures include an accommodative monetary policy, measures to boost growth while containing inflation, balancing out debt reduction with economic activity, implementing structural and tax reforms, supporting demand, and reprioritizing spending. In Mumbai, Ritu Singh. Okay, well, uh, speaking about numbers, here are, uh, here's the latest from Greece. Greece is rattling towards a weekend of drama that could surpass anything we've seen so far in the crisis. Alexis Tsipras' government has to draw up and deliver a credible economic plan to its creditors by the end of today. That is the only way they will have any chance of securing the third bailout plan that Greece requested yesterday. Prime Minister Tsipras, who's back in Athens after his bruising trip to the European Parliament, met with his cabinet today to discuss the details. Sections of his Syriza party will surely battle against the imposition of fresh austerity measures, especially after last Sunday's referendum. All right, now the IMF believes Greece needs a debt haircut, and that's the word coming in from Christine Lagarde, the IMF chief. Listen in. The context of, of Greece, uh, we have always advised that that program walk on two legs, if you will. One leg is about significant reforms and fiscal consolidation, as we have advised in the case of Ireland, Portugal, Cyprus, and outside the Eurozone, uh, Latvia, Iceland, and it has worked. And the other leg is um, debt restructuring, which we believe is needed in the particular case of Greece for it to have debt sustainability. Okay, on that note, let's take a look at European markets, which have ended the day on a high note on hopes that a fresh proposal will indeed be submitted by Greece today. The rebound in Chinese shares has also lifted sentiment on trading floors. In fact, we've seen the German DAX today rally over 2% and a bigger than 2.5% rally in the French markets and the FTSE also going home with very steady gains of 1.4%. Shireen?
Well, let's uh, do a quick check of what uh, is happening in the commodity space. Will be where oil prices have rebounded very sharply. In fact, Brent crude is trading more than a percent higher. In fact, it was trading at about uh, three percent higher the last I checked. Let's bring up that graph for you and show you where it is. Three percent higher, 58.82. Uh, the NYMEX is now at 53.08. That's also about three percent higher. And of course, the volatility continues in China. Markets regaining a footing after the great fall yesterday in Beijing today banned major shareholders from selling stake for the next six months. So anyone holding over 5% stake in companies will not be allowed to sell their shares. The ban applies to foreign investors as well, even though most of them hold less than 5% stake in Shanghai listed companies. Now the market regulator has warned of severe action against those flouting the rule. The country's banking regulator has said that it will use a series of measures to support the stability of the capital markets. Asian markets largely staged a turnaround today on the back of China. Martin Soong joins us now with a wrap of the Asian market action. Uh, but in a much better day today for Asia. So Asian markets were mixed today, uh, off-session lows, though that's the good news. But the big story was a huge rebound in Chinese stocks. Take a look at Shanghai here, up 5.8%, single biggest percentage gain since 2009, on the back of probably the most drastic move by authorities in China to stem the route. They're saying that owners of Chinese companies with a 5% stake or more, big shareholders, cannot sell for six months. Otherwise, they will face unspecified but certainly negative consequences there. And the worry is this interest interventionist approach by China may not be over. A lot of chatter and buzz in the market that the Chinese government could be on the cusp of basically a huge outsized policy move to help uh, Chinese stocks here, uh, basically bringing everything to bear, a buyer of last resort to try and keep this market from tanking further. It's an encouraging sign to see green on the screen. Uh, I think what's more encouraging is that we're starting to see some signs of clearing of the market. This is really the key issue, and I'm sure you're aware of this and discussed this, that with a number of stocks being suspended, we've had 32% of the market cap being suspended. We haven't really had a clearing of price that's fully taken place, and the deleveraging which has been going on hasn't yet fully purged. So that's really what we're looking for, for a sign of a market bottom. I think we've seen encouraging signals yesterday with some companies coming out of suspension and with companies buying back stock those are encouraging signs okay the seventh BRICS summit is underway in russia the new development bank headed by kv kamath is now open for business however full-fledged lending operations will only begin next year speaking earlier in the day prime minister modi proposed a BRICS trade fair and added that india would be happy to host for the first such event prime minister modi stressed that cooperation between the five nations is crucial to boost manufacturing and skill development tomorrow modi will meet his pakistani counterpart nawaz sharif on the sidelines of the summit BRICS economic cooperation strategy BRICS की प्रगति में एक milestone है इसमें कई सामाजिक पहल भी शामिल है मुझे खुशी है कि फोटोरेजा में दिए गए भारत के प्रस्तावों को इसमें शामिल किया गया है आर्थिक सहयोग पर हमारे restricted session में मैंने annual BRICS trade fair BRICS railway research center और सुप्रीम ऑडिट इंस्टीट्यूशन के बीच ब्रिक्स सहयोग हेतु सुझाव दिया था the new development bank signifies in a way the coming of age of uh, the de developing countries uh, their aspiration to stand on their own feet and uh, raise monies and uh, lend for a uh, development activity and i think that's the mandate that i as president would have sir there have been reports that are suggesting that the brics bank uh, would be asked to provide assistance to the Greece. So, uh, could you confirm this thing? I think at this point in time, those reports, uh, you know, I would not take any uh, heed because uh, we as a bank, uh, we have to decide what is uh, uh, going to be our timeline to invite other members. China is a is a key factor in this bank also. They are the founding member of the, of the bank. And recently we have seen the collapse of the equity market in China. So how do you read the situation as? I think those uh, things are un unconnected. I think uh, China has been a strong member. It is uh, you know, fast on the growth of uh, development. It has got a deep resource pool. And uh, we as, uh, you know, as a member, we look up to them to uh, provide the support that we uh, could expect a strong partner to provide. We have heard you saying that the, prim the primary focus and the priorities of the bank would be lending for the infrastructure. So could you spell out the, what would be the priorities of this new bank and how you are going to uh, cater the needs of the developing countries? You know, uh, everyone would say that our 
priorities are also towards infrastructure. I think what uh, would be different with this bank is uh, we will come with a very open mindset, a borrower's mindset, understand what the borrower wants, and then uh, structure everything appropriately. Well, that's the president of the BRICS Bank there, K.B. Kamal, and the Greek crisis, the turmoil in China, and the ongoing nuclear deal talks with Iran. They're just some of the major issues which are being influencing the global economy, says the finance minister. But he also reiterated that India is projecting a growth rate of 7 to 7.5% in the current fiscal and is the one bright spot in the world economy. Listen in. The whole world is a bright spot. The world is a bright spot. भारत आज सात साढ़े सात परसेंट से बढ़कर आठ फीसदी की तरफ जा रहा है और इस परिस्थिति का मौका उठा लाभ उठाने के लिए भारत को अपनी आर्थिक नीति भी और राजनीतिक सहयोग देश के भीतर भी उसको लागू करने के लिए आज हमें देने की आवश्यकता है ये मुझे पूरी दुनिया में बातचीत करने के बाद मेरा यह आकलन बनता है well, that's all the action there from the BRICS. But the big national story, the Supreme Court did not mince its words when it took up all the pleas related to the Vyapam case today. The apex court, while handing over the case to the Central Bureau of Investigation, has wrapped the Madhya Pradesh High Court, which refused to entertain the state government's plea to hand over the entire probe to the CBI. Notices have now been issued to all parties, including the state government, the central government, and the Madhya Pradesh governor, who has been given four weeks to respond. The Union Home Minister also met with the President to brief him on the situation. सीबीआई की जांच से जो भ्रम का जाल फैलाया गया था जो सवाल खड़े हुए थे जो कुहासा छाया था वो साफ होगा छटेगा और प्रत्येक मृत्यु की भी सीबीआई जांच होगी मेरे दिल पे एक बोझ जैसा था ये आज मैं अक्षय जी के परिवार से मिला उनकी माता जी की हालत मैंने देखी मैं बहन से मिला उनकी हालत देख के आत्मा रोती थी और मेरे मन पे एक बोझ था कि इस इन इन मौतों का सच सामने आना चाहिए संजय यादव मध्य प्रदेश पुलिस सिपाही थे तीन व्यापम के कांस्टेबल जो ट्रेनिंग पा रहे थे जो कि उत्तर प्रदेश के रहने वाले थे जो व्यापम में अक्यूज थे वो पुलिस एकेडमी से भागे उसमें सहयोग इन्होंने किया था इनको जब पुलिस ने पकड़ा तो इनको फिर सरकारी गवाह बनाया गया अब किन कारणों से डेथ हुई उसकी जानकारी मुझे नहीं है लेकिन हाँ ये बात सही है कि वो व्यापम के सरकारी गवाह थे well, we have Ashok Agriya joining in, who's in the courtroom, uh, uh, tracking all those details. Ashok, the going seems to be getting tougher for the Madhya Pradesh state government and also the governor. Uh, well, as far as the Madhya Pradesh governor is concerned, it's a huge embarrassment for him because what had really happened was on 6th of May this year itself, the Javanpur High Court had quashed the FIR which was lodged against him by the Madhya Pradesh police. But today in the Supreme Court, uh, the quashing of the FIR was challenged and the Supreme Court has admitted that petition and has even issued notices to the Madhya Pradesh governor asking him to explain why the FIR should not be reinstated against him, number one. Number two, as far as the passing on of the, CV, uh, of the probe in the Vyapam scam to CBI is concerned, the Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister kind of preempted us any kind of adversarial situation from the Supreme Court two days back when he wrote a letter to the Jabalpur High Court. So today, in a sense, even though the Supreme Court did not pass any uh, adverse remarks against the conduct of the Madhya Pradesh government, it did say that uh, all kinds of probes related to uh, Vyapam scams stand transferred to the CBI. Moreover, even uh, the cases pertaining to unnatural deaths of those, those who have been associated with the Vyapam scam will be probed by the CBI. Moreover, on the question whether the Supreme Court should be monitoring the CBI probe or not, that is something on which notices have been sent to the CBI. And on 24th of July, the CBI will be answering to this question as to why uh, the Supreme Court should not be monitoring the probe. Uh, but politically, it's a huge embarrassment, not only just for the government, but also the highest constitutional authority in the state, which is the governor, as well as the Jabalpur High Court, because the Supreme Court also passed strictures against the Jabalpur High Court when it said that the Jabalpur High Court was trying to wash it wash its hands of the Vyapam scam and in fact the High Court could have uh, transferred the probe to the CBI. Well, uh, more legal controversies there for the Madhya Pradesh governor and the government. On that note, we wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you so much for being with us this evening.
his first post earnings interview, TCS CEO N. Chandrasekharan will tell me if things are going to get worse before they get better as the company repositions itself for the digital economy. The Indian market is lately not rallying even on days when the Chinese and the European markets show some green. Are there any upside triggers left for the market? We try and get an opinion on market fundamentals from IIFL's Prabodh Agarwal and on the market's technicals from Atma's Sushil Kedia. Ahead of the industrial output numbers and the inflation numbers due on Monday, we ask the chief economist from JP Morgan, Jahangir Aziz, how the economy is positioned and whether a turnaround is round the corner. All that and more coming up for you on Bazaar tomorrow morning starting 8 a.m.